took off in the early morning and two and a half hours later, one airplane, only one, returned. And they came at each other head on, both of them firing. There are 11 of us up there and nobody knows for sure whether they blew each other up or, or collided. It doesn't matter. They both ended up in a pile of scrap metal down on the ground. Our liberty, our freedom, is a very expensive proposition, both in treasure and in blood. My name is Charlie Morley. I'm a volunteer here at the Frontiers of Flight U Museum, which is the reason for this uniform I'm wearing. That is what I learned to fly in. It's a PT-19. PT means primary trainer. The airplane was built by Fairchild. It had plywood wings, a fabric fuselage, a little six-cylinder inverted engine in there. And I'll assure you that open cockpit was cold in the winter time. And this is a picture of me when I was just learning to fly. 21 years old, primary flight training at Uvalde, Texas. Uh, we, when this picture was taken, we had finished our ground school where you studied aircraft identification and engines and uh, military systems and Morse code and got all your shots several times and that sort of thing. <clears throat> uh, and lots and lots and lots of physical training. I couldn't figure out why they wanted to build us up physically so much because after all a fighter pilot does is fight and sitting down until I got to flying these fighters and uh, they're not hard to fly but fighting one of them did take a whole lot of muscle. They knew what they were doing. This is at Uvalde, Texas. Now I've got to depart and talk about Uvalde for just a minute. A bunch of my classmates were New Yorkers, Manhattan, Queen, Brooklyn, so we went in town one day to look around. You can walk around Uvalde pretty quick, it's a small town. We came upon an old man sitting under a tree. He had a wash tub full of pecans, he was selling pecans. So we walked up and just started a conversation. And he was more interested in my friends than in me. With their uh, New York accent, they obviously weren't Texans. In about 15 minutes, got ready to leave, I stuck out my hand and said, Sir, I've enjoyed visiting with you. My name's Charlie Morley. He said, good to meet you, Charlie. My name's John Garner. And we recognized John Nance Garner, Vice President of the United States. He was born and raised in Uvalde, Texas. And that's why everything around that little town is Garner. It's Garner State Park and Garner Field and Garner everything. What chance do you think he'd have walking up on a vice president today? None. What? This was it was primary. I went from there. It took nine months to complete the, all three phases of training. This was primary. We went from there to Randolph Field in San Antonio, where we began to learn formation flying and uh, instrument flying and that sort of thing. After completing that, I was sent to Moore Field in Mission, Texas, the very southern tip of the state for advanced training, where we learned to fly a little bit bigger airplanes, AT-6s, and uh, learned to shoot and to dive bomb and that sort of thing. After completing that, I got my wings and commission, was sent to Sarasota, Florida, to learn to fly fighters, P-40s like the Flying Tigers were flying in China. This is a picture of a P-47 Thunderbolt, World War II single engine fighter. That's me in there flying it over the hedgerows of Normandy in 1944. <clears throat> that shadow in the lower left corner is the trailing edge of the wing where the camera was. This airplane was powered by an 18-cylinder, 2,000-horsepower engine. It carried four 50-caliber machine guns in each wing, so a total of eight guns. Under each wing on that pylon, we could hang as much as a 1,000-pound bomb 
a 500 pound one on the belly and in the wings we carried 4,000 rounds of armor piercing incendiary 50 caliber ammunition like that. One of these things will go clear through an automobile including the engine and start a fire. <clears throat> when you squeeze the trigger to fire the guns, all eight guns fired at once and you put out 96 of those per second something in front of you is going to get hurt real bad. And there is what happened. There's a railroad on the ground down there with a train on the tracks. Right there is the engine. If you can see all those little white spots, it's where bullets from all eight of my guns came to a point right in the cab of the engine and the thing is exploding. It's not likely anybody survived that. When I fired that burst, I'm coming at it out here, about 500 feet above the ground, and that's 250 yards in front of my airplane. We're going about 300 miles an hour there. This is also what we did. That's the remains of a German marshalling yard where they assembled trains. They brought these boxcars in, loaded them up, hooked an engine to them, took them out. This picture was taken by a very low-flying P-38 photo recon airplane four hours after we went by and dive-bombed the place. Now let me describe dive-bomb the way we did it. This airplane, the P-47, was the biggest, heaviest fighter of World War II. And when you got the nose down on it, the acceleration was extreme. So they warned us to never start a dive below 8,000 feet and dive at a 45 degree angle. Well, 8,000 feet is nearly two miles up, and you drop a bomb up there at that angle, and you have very little idea where it's going to hit the ground. So we began to experiment to find a better way to do it, and my squadron commander, Major Ralph Jenkins, came up with this system. Assume that the point of that bullet is the target. We would fly toward the target, not at 8,000, but at 5,000 feet. You're seated back here in the cockpit and you looked over the front of the, the leading edge of the wing at the target and t flew till it disappeared right there at the wing. You rolled on your back and then went straight down. Adjust your dive to get the dot of the gun sight on the target. Release your bombs and then we began a recovery from the dive. We would come out back down here about 700 feet above the ground at 400 miles an hour that low and that fast you're hard to hit so we never lost anybody down there but the accuracy of our attacks improved to where it was customary to see <clears throat> a guy roll in on his target and watch a pair of bombs straddle a german tank that's also what we did that's the remains of a german troop train carrying soldiers these boxcars were a steel frame with wood siding and top on them. We would hang a 100 gallon tank of gasoline on the belly of one of those planes, fly about 50 feet over that train, drop the tank on it, it would burst and splatter gasoline all over the wooden boxcar and the following fighter would shoot it and set it on fire. And it just burned up everything. That's an interesting picture. <clears throat> That's a picture of the 510th Fighter Squadron that I flew with, assembled for takeoff June 6, 1944. That's D-Day morning. There are 12 P-47s in that picture, and we could get all 12 of them in the air in about three to three and a half minutes. You remember the history of D-Day, the weather was stinking that day, and you can see the water being kicked up by propellers back there. This is actually the second mission D-Day morning. I flew the first mission that day and took this picture of the second preparing to go out. Standing back here where I was to take that picture with all those big engines running, you could feel the ground tremble. There's a lot of power sitting out there. kind of interesting the way this picture and several of the others in this presentation, the way they got here is interesting. When we came back from overseas, the intelligence people took all our pictures away from us. I think they were afraid we would upset the civilian population. 
I took my camera, we, my camera was used 35 millimeter film, and I just wrapped that film around behind the sweatband in my cap, wore them home. That's how we got these. You had to learn to be sneaky. Now our fighter group, the 405th fighter group, was organized and trained at Walterboro, South Carolina, near Charleston. We went overseas as a unit. We went to England. That is the south coast of England. This is the English Channel. This is German-occupied France. We would be down in here shooting up trains and trucks and radar stations and artillery and stuff like that and come back across the channel, find the little Isle of Wight, because right across that little strait is the little bitty town of Christchurch. And that's where our airfield was, except calling what we flew off of an airfield is somewhat of a joke. There it is. This is the shoreline, the white chalk cliffs. There's the runway. There's a stream that ran across the runway and out down there. They just piled logs in there to fill it in, packed dirt around it, and laid steel wire mesh from here across the creek down to there. And there's your airfield, fellas. Now, in addition to the fact that that airfield is not 5,000 feet of concrete, it was only 4,500 feet of wire mesh. We overloaded the airplane as much as 1,000 pounds and still got it off the ground. This is a Horsa glider factory. The Horsa was the cargo and troop carrying glider built by the English. That's what you see parked right there, those four little airplanes. Those are Horsa gliders. This is the little village of Muddyford. One day, two of my pilot buddies and I were walking right down here watching one of the other squadrons in our group take off. One of their planes got up about there and the engine quit. He went down, hit the top of a house, crashed in there, and burst into flame. Well, the neighbors around there did what folks anywhere would do. They all came running down to look at the wreck. And we knew there were three 500-pound bombs in that fire. So we were running down there to warn the people and chase them away. We got about, oh, 50 to 100 feet away from the wreck when one of those bombs cooked off. <clears throat> the guy next to me, his name was Arthur Williams. He was from Kansas, and he's about arm's length away. And a piece of shrapnel about so big hit him right in the chest and went clear through. He was killed right there. The guy on the other side of me had a piece of shrapnel hit his ear, and it took a piece of his ear out. He recently retired as President Emeritus of the South Carolina Senate, Senator John Drummond. I didn't get badly hurt. I got skinned up a little bit, but was introduced to the concussion from an explosion like that. There were 21 people killed there, and I'm walking around in the middle of that carnage with no idea where I was or what I was doing. It was about 15 minutes before I finally regained my senses and my ears still ring. I sound like a head full of crickets all the time. Now, after the Normandy invasion, we moved across the English Channel to France to begin flying close support to the ground troops. We were Ninth Air Force. What we flew off, of, well, let me get my geography lesson out here and locate where we moved to. When we moved across the channel, the land between that road and the shoreline was in Allied hands. Our troops landed right there at Utah Beach, right there at Omaha Beach. The English landed three beaches right down here, Gold, Sword, and Juno. That is the city of St. Lo headquarters to an entire German army in this area. Right there is the little bitty town of San Marigris. If you saw the movie The Longest Day where a parachute is hung off a church steeple, that's San Marigris. They bailed out like 4.30 in the morning. One of them had his parachute saddled right over the top of the church in the middle of the town. And that guy hung up there and watched about a thousand of his buddies get killed down around him. 
the French people keep a parachute hanging up there. It rots away in time, of course, but they replace it, uh, and they have a dummy hanging in it as a uh, uh, tribute to those guys. So that's San Mariglis. Four and a half miles southwest of San Mariglis is a little bitty town of Picaville. It's too small to be on this map. Picaville is where our airfield was. It was within two and a half miles of the German front lines. Now, there's the airfield at Picaville. If you think that the one in England was a disaster, this was even worse. Uh, that, that runway is not 5,000 feet of concrete. It's 3,800 feet of tar paper. And I'm, we still overloaded the airplane a thousand pounds and still got it off the ground. That is an English Spitfire doing a buzz job down our runway. This is an apple orchard. Now this is a piece of history that they ought to teach in our schools. <clears throat> Air Corps engineers moved into that apple orchard with a bunch of bulldozers and just went through uprooting trees, shoved the logs out of the way filled in the holes, packed the dirt down, and laid what was called Hessian matting. Hessian matting is a half inch thick, heavy tar paper. That's the striping you see on the runway. In addition to the fact that it wasn't 5,000 feet of concrete, it was only 3,800 feet of tar paper. We still overloaded the airplane and still got it off the ground. You sat at the end of the runway and locked your brakes, just opened the throttle wide open and turned it loose. My description was when I began to feel life in the wings, I pulled the landing gear handle up. The wheels couldn't retract because they wouldn't slide, there's too much friction. But the minute there's enough lift to reduce the friction, the wheels started up, you pull the nose of the plane up and climbed out. You sat at the end of the runway, locked your brakes, Turned the air, opened the throttle wide open, turned it loose. Uh, we'd usually leave the ground about 150 to 200 feet before the end of the runway. And it looked kind of like that. You see the end of the runway way back there. And there they are laying the Hessian matting. This seam has been locked. They're locking that seam. When they got them locked, then they poured melted tar on them. That's the striping you saw in that first picture. <clears throat> Before we started flying off of that, they took those trees out, which was thoughtful. <laughs> That's how we lived. That is our, oh, that is our officer's club. The lumber came out of bomb crates and shell crates. The roof on the thing was canvas latrine screens. Dick Parker and Larry Goffin were pilots. That's me. That's our exec officer. We called our officers club Flak Haven, Flax anti-aircraft fire. What that reads is through these portals past the best g damn strafers who ever drove a crowd general into a hedgerow. Where that legend came from was, uh, I'll talk about the uh, our tearing up of a German army later. They captured the aid to the commander of that, German commander of that ar army. They asked him, where is your commanding officer? And he said, I have no idea. The last time I saw him, he was crawling through the bushes. When you reduce the uh, corps commander to crawling through the bushes, you've destroyed that army. That's also how we live. <coughs> These guys are all three of them pilots. You did your bathing and shaving out of your steel helmet. Somebody's got some water heating in a bucket on an open fire back there. That's pretty primitive. That's also how we lived. <clears throat> These guys are both pilots. Sandy Johnston is getting a new hairdo. Eddie Whittison was not a barber. He was a florist when he first joined the outfit. Didn't matter, he's just chopping hair off. We lived in the tents you see scattered in the trees and there's somebody's laundry hanging on a tree branch back there. One day there's a young girl standing in the weeds out there holding a bucket. 
She's 14 years old. <clears throat> Our flight surgeon, Doc Milligan, spoke French. So he went out and asked that girl, what are you doing here? You're right in the middle of a combat outfit. The kid explained that she hoped when we finished a meal, if there's any food left, she might take some to her family because they were hungry. The war had killed all their animals, torn up their garden so they couldn't grow anything. This is an apple orchard, there's no fruit on the trees, and they were afraid to get on the road to look for food because if they did, they're likely to get killed. Our orders were, you catch anything on the rails or roads moving, you shoot it. Our mess sergeant was a Chinaman by the name of Singh, Sergeant Lee Singh. He said, Doc, you go tell that girl to come back with her family three meals a day. We'll take care of them as long as we stay here. So we had guests for our peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. One day, Sergeant Singh came over to me and he said, Captain, would you do me a favor? Well, sure, Sarge, whatever you want. Well, on the pylons, under the wings of this airplane, these things, we hung bombs. We could also hang external fuel tanks to extend the range of the airplane. And one type of those tanks were made by the English. They held 108 gallons and were made of paper mache which was liquid proof for maybe three hours. Sergeant Singh mixed up 70 gallons of powdered milk, dumped in 20 gallons of mixed fruit cocktail, 25 pounds of sugar, three gallons of Calvados, a good tasting apple brandy they made in that orchard country, and a few other spices. Got it all mixed up, poured it in one of those paper tanks, hung it on the wing of my airplane, said now, take that up where it really gets cold. So I took off and climbed up to 35,000 feet and swapped the airplane around like that about 15 minutes to try to keep it stirred up. The temperature up there is 55 to 60 degrees below zero. That's gonna freeze that mixture pretty quick. Finally rolled the airplane over, dived down and landed. They dropped the tank off the wing, chopped it open with an ax and we enjoyed Tutti Frutti ice cream. Now that was expensive ice cream because the engine in that airplane burned 100 gallons an hour of 150 octane gasoline at cruising, 300 gallons at power. And we didn't care. If Sergeant Singh wants ice cream, he shall have ice cream. Now through the hole in the clouds down there on the ground, those dark lines you see, those are hedgerows. For the benefit of those who have not been into the hedgerow country of Normandy, in that part of the, the France, the farmers didn't separate their fields with fencing like ours do. They built a berm, a mound of dirt, planted trees and bushes on it. That's what separated their fields. Some of those things have been there longer than the United States has been a country and they're really solid and they pinned our soldiers down. A ground soldier looking over the top of one of those is likely to get his head blown off by a sniper. When our tanks <clears throat> tried to go through that country, they run up over a berm and the belly's exposed, they got hit with an anti-tank weapon. So to get them out of there, they sent a bunch of heavy bombers, B-17s and B-24s, excuse my hiccups, those bombers came in at a relatively low altitude for bombers, about 5,000 feet, and <clears throat> just blew out about a five-mile square, wiped out everything in there. And our troops got through that opening into flat country south of the hedgerows. Let me go back to the geography lesson for a minute. I remember we're flying out of Peekaville right up here. General Montgomery, British General Montgomery, had his army right down here. By this time, General Omar Bradley had the American First Army over here. The Germans, located at St. Lo, were trapped between Montgomery and Bradley. They blew the hole out down there, and Bradley got his tanks through the opening and headed east toward Paris, south of the hedgerows. 
the Germans are now trapped between Montgomery and Bradley, and they got on that road at night to try to escape from that pocket. We didn't know they were moving. We took off up here at Peekaville just at dawn through a search pattern and came across that road that was bumper to bumper enemy traffic as far as you could see. We turned and flew up to the head of the column, dropped a bomb on the lead tank and stopped them, called our squadron and told them what we'd found. They reported to the group and the group sick the other two fighter squadrons on that German column and created the wildest sky you could imagine. Anti-aircraft fire coming up all over the place, fires and explosions everywhere, airplanes coming in from every direction, the radio traffic of guys screamed, I'm on fire, I'm bailing out, I'm hit, I'm going down, I'm out of ammo, I'm going back. And right in the middle of that frenzy came a voice that yelled, I want my mommy. You had to have a sense of humor to survive in that environment. Now our job when those bombers went in was to go in ahead of the bombers and strafe the anti-aircraft guns. You have seen pictures of streams of anti-aircraft fire coming up. Flying down into that is a really dangerous business, but you see there's only one pilot in a fighter plane. So if you're going to lose an airplane, it's best to lose a fighter with one man in it than a bomber with ten men. So we went down ahead of the bombers to shut down, to strafe and shut down the anti-aircraft guns. And this is the briefing for that mission. Now I'm going to talk about dead men. They were not all killed on the one mission, however. This guy commanded one of the other squadrons in our group. That's my squadron commander, Major Bruce Parcell. He was killed. Next to him is me. I wasn't killed. Next to me is Jim Pelletier, who was killed. Kelly was killed. Michael Reagan survived. He was killed. That cat belonged to my best buddy, Ben Savage, who was killed. That's Jim Koontz, who was killed. Of the recognizable people in that picture, who survived. This is what people don't understand about the loss of life in World War II. Most everybody has some idea of the Marines on Iwo Jima, and it was a slaughter, of course. But the highest loss rate, that is the percentage killed relative to the numbers involved, were the submarine crews, because after all, you sink one of those, you've got 100% of them. But the second highest loss rate were the airmen. The 8th Air Force alone, just the 8th Air Force flying out of England in less than three years had 47,000 airmen killed. The 100th Bomb Group of the 8th Air Force had 1,000 men killed on a single two-hour raid. We call them the bloody 100th. They took off in the early morning and two and a half hours later, one airplane, only one, returned. And believe it or not, it was flown by a guy named Luckadoo. We call him Lucky Luckadoo. He comes into this museum on the fourth Friday of the month for our Happy Warriors meeting. We've got a picture of him downstairs here. When my buddy Ben Savage, this guy was killed, we were strafing a truck convoy. Anti-aircraft fire hit his plane. It crashed and killed him. After we and the Germans left the area, the French people around there got his body out of the wreckage, wrapped him in an American flag, and buried him. Two days later, the front lines had moved past there. So Doc Milligan, our flight surgeon, took a couple of guys in a jeep, went down, and dug him up and took him to the American Cemetery at Normandy, which you see there. For those who haven't been there, I know they've seen pictures of it, beautifully landscaped with marble crosses and stars of David for the Jewish guys. These are wooden. They just nailed the dog tags on there to identify the grave. That's my buddy Ben Savage. We buried him in there 40 days after D-Day, there were 6,400 graves in there. 
right behind that tree line is Omaha Beach where our soldiers landed on D-Day morning. Think about this. In one day, June 6, 1944, about 4,500 Americans were killed on that beach in one day. Our liberty, our freedom, is a very expensive proposition, both in treasure and in blood. <clears throat> always has been and probably always will be, because there will always be a dictator somewhere who wants to build himself up by taking us down. It's been tried over and over, hadn't worked yet. That's my buddy, Ben Savage, who we had just buried. He's leaning on the propeller of his airplane, which gives you an idea about the size of the plane. That propeller was a 13-foot diameter arc. Big plane. He called his airplane the Red Honey. His wife was a redhead. And there's what it looks like today. This guy is one of our volunteers, Jim Jenkins. He took this picture a couple of years ago. Uh, that's my squadron buddy, Ben Savage. That's my commanding officer, Bruce Parcell. They were shot down within two days of each other, buried within two days of each other. The reason that place is so beautiful, if you haven't been there, I know you've seen pictures of it, beautifully landscaped with marble crosses and stars of David for the Jewish guys. The reason that's so pretty, that land belongs to the United States. It was given to this country by France so we could bury our dead in American soil. But it isn't cared for by either the French or American governments. It's cared for by French citizens that live around there. A family will adopt four, five, eight, ten graves and they take care of them. And that's the reason that place is so spotlessly beautiful. And just for as a matter of interest, there is a waiting list for families to, to get in on that program. I have a young friend in France, a guy named Jan Rivlin. I asked him, Jan, why do the French dislike Americans? He said, you don't understand. The French love the Americans. You're talking about French politicians, and they aren't much different than yours or you're talking about Parisians and they don't like anybody, including other Frenchmen, unless they are Parisians. But these are the real people of France and you get in that country and let them know you're an American, you'll find out quick we are both admired and appreciated. That's an illustration of the amount of abuse that a P-47 could absorb and still bring you back. That's the uh, tail of the airplane, the elevator. He got hit by a 37 millimeter anti-aircraft shell like that thing that blew a hole big enough for him to stand up in, but he flew it back. We had another guy return from a mission with a piece of telephone pole about that long jammed in the wing. He hit the pole about a foot from the top. It broke off and he came back with that splintered hunk in the wing. They had to replace the wing, but it got him back. My airplane got shot up on 13 different missions. That was the first time. <clears throat> That's the elevator, the movable part of the tail, which makes the plane go up and down. <clears throat> I got hit there by a 20 millimeter shell like that thing that blew a hole in it. The hole is not a problem. The problem here was that big piece of metal blown down acted as a giant trim tab and that airplane kept trying to climb and I had to fly it with both hands jammed against the stick to hold the nose down part of the time with my foot on it because 45 minutes of that was really tiresome. The worst I got hit, and I don't have pictures of this but I can describe it maybe. We were coming out of the Ruhr Valley. We'd been shooting trains. We were at about 8,000 feet and an 88 millimeter anti-aircraft shell blew up under the left wing and rolled the plane. An 88 millimeter shell is about that long. When one of those things hits you, believe me, you're aware of it. You hurt all the way to your teeth. 
the thing rolled the airplane. I got it right at just as the next one hit the engine cowling. It blew a cylinder and two cylinder heads off the engine, and the thing kept running for 40 minutes, long enough to get me behind the American lines. So when it crashed, I didn't get captured. It sounded like an oil drum full of bricks and was throwing oil all over the place, but it ran good enough to keep an eight-ton fighter in the air. We got back to the little town of chalon sur marne a grass airfield southeast of Paris, where we intended to land and refuel. I put the landing gear handle down and the right wheel dropped down and locked. Couldn't get it back up because there was no hydraulic pressure, which meant I couldn't use the flaps to land, and there was no left landing gear at all. That first shell had jammed it in the wheel well. We had a ground controller down there, a guy with a microphone sitting in a Jeep, and I called down and asked for permission to land, and he told me, I don't want that wreck on my field. You get away from here and, ba and bail out, we'll come pick you up. I was scared to bail out, decided to land it anyway. I came in to pr approach that field at about 185 miles an hour and sat it down very gently on one wheel let the wingtip drop down and dig into the dirt and it spun the plane like that and I never got a scratch. P-47 is the best fighter plane ever built as far as I'm concerned. There's an interesting picture. That's General Dwight Eisenhower, Supreme Commander of all Allied Forces. That's General Elwood Casada, Commander of the 9th Tactical Air Force. The picture came about this way. General Eisenhower wanted to fly over the front lines and look at the battles going on down there. So General Casada took a P-51 Mustang, cut a panel out of the side of it, and put a little bench in behind the seat, sat Eisenhower on that bench, and at low altitude flew him up and down the front lines so he could look at the battles going on. I was told that when General George Marshall found out about that, he was so angry he came close to court-martialing both of them. It was not a smart thing to do. Not your supreme commander and one of his two top air generals, but that was Casada's style and he got away with it. That's an illustration of the size of a P-47. <clears throat> In that picture, I'm seated right there on the wing. Look at the size of the nose out in front of you. When you came in to land, if you made a straight approach to the airfield, like airplanes do out at this airfield, you make a straight in approach and you're way back there in that cockpit looking over that great big nose, you couldn't see the airfield out there, much less the runway. <coughs> So you see pictures of World War II fighters coming into land. They're coming in real low, and they peel up like that. They're not hot-dogging. There's a reason for that. A fighter at low altitude and low speed is very vulnerable. So we wanted to come in fast and then kill your speed and get on the ground quickly. If you cut the throttle and pull it into a tight climbing turn, that will kill the speed in a hurry. So that's what we did. We came in real low, cut the throttle, pulled it up into a tight turn, immediately put your landing and flap handles down, and you're going to be landing out of a circular traffic pattern. About here, your landing gear's down. On the back side of the turn, back here, you're coming around, you're looking out the side of the airplane, looking down the wing at the runway, and you just slid it sideways like that till you got near the ground, kicked it straight and let it land. It worked every time. And that's what it took to keep one running in World War II. A four-man crew assigned to each airplane. I'm the pilot that flies it. These guys don't fly, they are my ground crew. Sergeant Francis Jones was the crew chief his mechanic was Sergeant John Icavetta. His armorer was Corporal Stan Stone, who took care of the guns, bombs, and ammunition. 
I'm going to depart and talk about Corporal Stone for just a minute because he's an interesting guy. He did a perfect job. I never had a malfunction in any of the weaponry. However, he was from Brooklyn, the world's most accomplished griper. He complained and griped and belly ached about everything all the time. So one day he's under the wing making adjustments on that bomb shackle. He had me up in the cockpit pulling the release for him. A fighter, P-38, part landed, part next to our plane. And the pilot, dressed in a sweaty old flying suit, got out and walked by. He looked down, he said, Corporal, how are things going? Well, Stone didn't look up. He said, oh, they'd be all right, except there's some blankety blank, 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 damn big shot coming in. And they had us cleaning up around here all morning. And that pilot said, I didn't expect any special attention. And both uh, Stone and I look out at Major General Elwood Casada commander of the 9th TAC, under whose command we flew. <clears throat> what could Stone do? He jumped up and saluted, and the general returned the salute, but he made an issue of it. He scowled at him, kind of leaned in toward him, very slowly brought his hand up to his goggles and just held him there, and then very slowly lowered his hand and grinned at him and walked off. General Casada was a good guy. He was sort of a hero, really. Uh, he's the guy who invented the idea, or developed the idea, of uh, putting radios and frequ frequencies in the airplanes and in the t tanks on the ground so we could communicate with each other, which al allowed us to attack targets close to our own troops without fear of killing them. That was General Casada. The technique is still in use today. <coughs> These guys, from a pilot standpoint, were heroic. If, if they made a mistake, you're dead. Mine never made a mistake. Never. They took great pride in their airplane, and that's the way they considered it. That was their airplane. They allowed me to fly it for them. I would get up in the cockpit to fly a mission and Sergeant Jones would get up on the wing and help strap me in. He always said, good luck, Captain. Now you take care of my airplane. I walked up to the plane one day. Jones is up in the cockpit. He had tied the tail down so it couldn't bounce and run the engine wide open doing an engine check and I walked up just as he's shutting it down. He climbed out and came over and he said, you know, I wonder what that sounds like up in the air. Well, Jones, would you like to find out? He said, sure. So we took the parachute and the cushion out of the seat. He sat in the seat, I sat in his lap. We couldn't get the seat belt around both of us, but I went ahead and took off. I got up 12,000 feet and just opened that throttle wide open. You got 2,000 horsepower screaming out there. Went beyond that stop to the next stop, which turned on the water injection. It got you somewhere around 350 to 400 more horsepower, and it just slapped you back in the seat like that. Jones let out a yell. Boy, his baby is really performing. And I rolled the airplane. Now remember, no seat belts. If you do a slow roll like that, you're going to fall out or fall into the canopy. But a barrel roll is like swinging a bucket of water around. Do it right and centrifugal force will keep you in the seat or the water in the bucket. And that's the way I rolled it like that. And obviously did it right because I'm still here. But he was the only one of my crew willing to try that. When a pilot joined, they took a portrait like this of each of us. In that picture, I'm 22 years old and considered myself to be a hotshot fighter pilot. Uh, there's a kind of cute little story here. One day there was a bunch of school children in here in the museum <coughs> listening to my story. And there was a little bitty girl right in front. She was maybe five and a half, possibly six-year-old kid. And she just looked real puzzled, kept looking from that picture back at my face like that, you know, 
and held up her hand and I said, yeah, what is it? She said, what happened? How do you answer that? It's okay, I'm 22 years old in that picture. Look at the face in this picture. I'm 22 years old in that one too, but that's after only 50 combat missions. I'm halfway through my tour and the exhaustion, the weariness, the tension is pretty evident in that face. We had just come back from one of the filet gap missions that I talked about earlier when that picture was taken, which is why I've got my flight gear on. <clears throat> it was about a week or two after that picture was taken that General Casada was on our base. We were bull shooting with him. Somebody said, uh, General, uh, eight Air Force pilots get to go home after 30, 35 missions. Most of us have already flown 50 missions. When are you going to let some of us go home? And the General looked at him and said, Lieutenant, we're prepared to replace every airplane three times and every pilot twice. <coughs> At least you understood he's being honest with us. <laughs> he was there for several reasons. One was to tell us that we had been recommended for a presidential unit citation. That was for that filet gap mission uh, that I talked about. He was also there to award medals to four of our pilots. One of them was my wingman fighter squadron, two planes stay together like that to watch each other's tail. This guy was my wingman. His name was Boleslaw Kosinski. Now clearly Boleslaw Kosinski is no Irishman. He was a good Polish kid from Buffalo, New York. Clean, decent, smart, excellent pilot and he got a medal. The general pinned the medal on his shirt, shook hands with him and said, congratulations, lieutenant, thank you and God bless you. He started to step to the next one and he stopped and looked back and said, lieutenant, how old are you? I'm 19, sir. The general nodded and started to step aside and looked back again and said, does your mother know you're over here? This is a picture of coach standing on the wing of his airplane, which he called the K-Kid. He was shot down and killed about two weeks after that picture was taken, two or three weeks after the picture was taken. <clears throat> he was 19 years old when he died. My wingman and the only one of our pilots to be shot down by an enemy aircraft. It happened this way. It's a real hazy day with about two-thirds broken overcast. Major Jenkins is leading the mission and he sent Coach and I down to skip bomb a small bridge, take that bridge out. We had just dropped our bombs and were pulling up like that when somebody yelled, Bandit. That's code word for enemy aircraft. We both looked around. It looked like a sky full. It probably was four, maybe five, six ME German fighters, ME-109s, diving through a hole in the clouds right at us. We both turned to face them like that. The lead 109 was coming so fast he couldn't duck, pull out of that dive quick enough to get his guns aimed at me and I couldn't get around to aim at him. We passed each other just like that, about 20 feet apart so close I could see he's wearing a white uniform. But Coach and the enemy were farther out and they came at each other head on, both of them firing. There are 11 of us up there and nobody knows for sure whether they blew each other up or, or collided. It doesn't matter. They both ended up in a pile of scrap metal down on the ground. I want to give you an idea of what we accomplished. We being the 405th Fighter Group. <clears throat> and don't panic, I'm not going to read all this. I'll pick and choose a few items. Our group, 
405th Fighter Group at 36 B-47s in just under one year we destroyed and this is destroyed damaged is another list we destroyed 6,289 motor transports 358 battle tanks 840 railroad locomotives 4,410 railroad cars 27 bridges 237 artillery positions uh, we cut 748 railroads, sunk 61 vessels, blew out 234 railroad marshalling yards, and 240 enemy airplanes on the ground that never even got in the air. In that year's time, we expended 6,167,000 rounds of that ammunition, dropped 4,633 tons of bombs, lost 125 aircraft and had 700 of them come back badly damaged, but they made it back. All in all, we were a pretty destructive bunch of people. Now I want to talk about our country, the United States of America. That is the way the P-47 was built. This is the bubble top. The Razorback was essentially the same airplane. The Razorback was the first of them. <clears throat> That's a pretty complex structure. Just before America got in the war, that airplane did not exist. Two guys were building airplanes up in Long Island. Alexander Seversky, the president of the company, his design engineer, Alexander Kartvelli, both Russian immigrants who came here after World War I and stayed because they wanted no part of communism. They were building a small plane, a racer, high speed, on floats. Also a small fighter, a P-35, which was mostly used to train fighter pilots. General Hap Arnold, Air Corps commander, said, I need a new fighter. It's got to go faster than anything we have, go higher than anything we have, be more heavily armed and heavily armored, and it must have an air-cooled radial engine as opposed to the liquid-cooled engine like in a Spitfire or a Mustang. From the time they began designing on this until they flew the prototype was nine months. And that's before computers. That was done with slide rules and tracing paper. Before the war was over, they had built 16,400 of them in less than three years. In that three-year time span, the airplane that America built the most of was a four-engine B-24 bomber. This country built 18,000 of those things in less than three years. In that time span, the United States built about 350,000 warplanes, twice as many as Germany, England, Russia, Japan, and Italy combined. If Hitler and Germany and Tojo and Japan had had any idea of the productive capacity of a free people unencumbered by a bureaucracy, they would never have started that fight with us. Field Marshal Gunther von Kluge, the German commander of all their ground forces, made the statement, he said, we were not defeated by conventional forces, we were defeated by the P-47 Thunderbolts of the 9th Air Force and the British Typhoons. Adolf Hitler had an interesting comment also. He said America has the Boy Scouts, Germany has the Hitler Youth, and the Hitler Youth will win. What he didn't realize is that my squadron commander was an Eagle Scout, I'm an Eagle Scout. We had two other Eagles in the squadron and a bunch of Scouts that were not yet Eagles. Hitler really didn't know what he was getting into. Now. <clears throat> I want to recite a couple of poems uh, for you. One of them, High Flight, is the most eloquent description of flight that I have ever heard. Oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter silvered wings. Sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds 
and done a hundred things that you've not dreamed of, wheeled and soared and swung high in the sunlit silence. And hovering there, I've chased the shouting winds along and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. <clears throat> up, up the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the windswept heights with easy grace, where never lark nor even eagle flew. And while with silent lifting mind, I've trod the high, untrespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand and touched the face of God. That poem was written by John Gillespie McGee, Jr., an American pilot who joined the Royal Canadian Air Force during World War II and was killed at age 19. There he is standing in front of his Spitfire fighter. To have written that poem by 19 is truly remarkable. In addition to which, he was flying escort to bombers up around 28,000 feet. <coughs> And he began to hear that poem in his mind. By the time he landed, he had composed and memorized it. To have lost that mind, that 19, <laughs> that's, that is a shame. I wrote a poem also. I was a commercial artist, and our squadron intelligence officer and I put together a history of our squadron and I wrote this poem to print on the page where we pictured all of our killed in action guys. We had 24 pilots in the squadron, 18 were killed. It's titled Forever on My Wing. In fighter planes they flew with us, these gallant men with silver wings. Brothers all through hostile skies, a peaceful world we sought to bring. Then flame from hell lanced upward. The air was ripped by jagged steel, and terror was the major thing that each of us could feel. All knew in such a frenzied sky that some of us would not survive. Yet their guns with ours erupting fire, into the face of death we dived. The gods of war by random choice called these young men to flame and die. We saw them spin like shattered hawks, but in memory still they share our sky. And now, in silent ghostly echelon, these faithful comrades from the past will fly our wings in close formation till all our squadrons stilled at last. At a squadron reunion held 30 years ago, our flight surgeon, Doc Milligan, had bought a $450 bottle of the finest brandy ever made, had a beautiful wooden box made to contain it, presented it to the squadron to be consumed by the last of us still standing. I'm hoping to get that, which may explain why I'm still here at age 91. Now my last little story doesn't involve me. It involves this guy. His name, Sherman Goodfriend. That's his real name. Sherman was a lead bombardier in B-24s flying out of Italy. The lead bombardier is the guy that sits out in the glass nose of that bomber getting shot at first. <clears throat> he's the one with the bomb sight. He's got to be good because he sights on the target, releases his bombs. And when his fall clear of the plane, all the rest of the bombardiers toggle their switch to drop theirs. <clears throat> They came back from a mission one day, and all the airplanes had been all shot to pieces. Only one of them was really flyable, and they got a call from an infantry outfit for them to come and take out a German marshalling yard 
the Germans were moving a lot of ordnance through that yard. They wanted it destroyed. Uh, only one airplane's flyable. Sherman's pilot, a guy named Lansky, said he'd fly the mission, and Sherman went along as the bombardier. A lone bomber in enemy territory is a magnet for every anti-aircraft gun, gun in the territory, plus all the fighters. But they headed out toward, the, toward that railroad yard. They were attacked by an ME-109 that was coming right straight at them, shooting right at Sherman, and he grabbed the machine gun in the nose and shot that German down. They got to the target, he dropped, sighted on a target, dropped his bombs and wiped it out in one pass. Uh, for that, he did get the president, uh, got the uh, uh, distinguished flying cross. <clears throat> His buddy, he had a buddy in the squadron who said, uh, Sherman got a three day leave to go to Rome to uh, uh, rest and relaxation, R&R. &R. His buddy said, Sherman, do me a favor. He said, you know, and this is after the front lines had moved north of Rome. He said, the Pope comes out on a balcony outside of his apartment and blesses the crowd and all their artifacts. Go there and buy two rosaries and get them blessed by the Pope and bring them back to me. You see, this guy was married to a, he was a Protestant boy married to a Catholic girl, and his mother-in-law just hated him for it. Well, Sherman went to St. Peter's Square, bought the rosaries, and instead of coming out on the balcony, this is Pope Pius XII, invited everybody up to his audience chambers upstairs. So Sherman went upstairs with them. He's standing there in the crowd holding the rosaries. Four Swiss guards carried the Pope in on a sedan chair so he could see over the top of the crowd. Um, he, he spots this American soldier in his uniform with his silver bombardier wings. He came over, put his hands on Sherman's hands, blessed the rosaries, and then he blessed Sherman, who took the rosaries back, gave them to his buddy, who sent one to his wife and one to his mother-in-law and became the greatest son-in-law who ever lived. He never did tell either one of those women, Sherman's a Jew, which to me makes it the most beautiful war story of all. Sherman uh, used to hear at the museum tell that story himself. He began to get weaker and weaker and couldn't do it anymore and asked me if I would uh, recite this story for him and he monitored me a couple of times to make sure I got it right. Sherman just died about three weeks ago. We were strafing a truck convoy one day. This is a truck. I shot at the truck, pulled out of the dive, passed over it, and I'm maybe 150, 200 feet above him looking down as I went by and saw a German soldier swing his rifle like that and I felt a bullet hit. I wasn't bleeding and I didn't hurt anywhere, so I got back and told my crew chief, Jones, I think I got hit, and he said, yeah, you did. There's a hole in the side of the airplane, and we found that bullet embedded in the side of my parachute about an inch behind my back. That guy almost got lucky, and I really got lucky. <laughs> You see pictures of any aircraft, by the way, that's what that bullet looks like before it was fired. It's an eight millimeter copper jacket, probably used by snipers. You see pictures of any aircraft fire in the sky that look like black puff, puffs of cotton. That ain't cotton. Each of those black puffs is either an 88 or 105 millimeter anti-aircraft shell exploding. When they explode, they break up into chunks of steel like that thing. That one came through the side of my airplane right there by my shoulder and stopped right there in the instrument panel. You get, it appears to have aluminum embedded in it. I knew that they didn't make cannon shells 
out of aluminum. So I asked an artillery sergeant, what is that? He said, when that thing came through the side of your airplane, it was white hot. It just picked up aluminum as it went by. So I've got part of my airplane permanently enshrined in steel. But I'll assure you, you get hit with that thing, you'd have a health problem. Now you remember my talking about the Filet Gap mission that we flew, for which we did get the presidential unit citation. Every pilot that flew those missions either got an air medal or a distinguished flying cross. There's a picture of a small section of that road. That road was 15 miles of that destruction, and there's nothing alive down there. Not people, not horses, not trucks, not tanks, wagons, nothing. That's why they quit. I want to thank everybody for listening and coming in to visit our museum. Uh, you all are what makes it worth our while to get up in the morning. Thank you. <laughs>